Hello, this is Dr. K here. Welcome everyone to our webinar. It's, uh, uh, I believe it's uh, Thursday actually, on the eve before um, destruction and rebirth of the planet. Exciting times. And uh, not so exciting um, are uh, today's markets action. Um, we had two very good up days at the beginning of the week. Strong up days as the uh, fiscal cliff issue uh, seemed to be nearing resolution. And then as that resolution started to drift away, uh, we had a slight pullback yesterday and a continuation of that pullback today um, on light volume. And, and also the fact that we've had two strong up days, it's natural and constructive actually for the markets to pull back in this fashion. So the market direction model remains on a buy signal. We are seasonally strong. Um, that, that is December, usually the bottom half of, of December. Um, you not necessarily will get a Santa Claus rally, but the markets don't break down. We don't get some sudden breaking of markets that cause, cause uh, serious pullbacks. You might get a gentle pullback, but generally speaking, um, the risk levels are lower the bottom half of December. Um, now, as far as other uh, instruments such as gold and silver, the precious metals, um, they've been, well, relative to what they've been doing prior, they're, they're selling off quite substantially on higher volume. And again, this is uh, in part due to uh, various issues, economic issues, and other issues such as fiscal cliff looking better and better and so uh, gold as a risk uh, on trade becomes less and less appealing and so it's being sold off um, and further uh, point out that if you look at the weekly chart of GLD uh, it's completely within its basing pattern it uh, I'm not surprised to see this kind of action but ultimately quantitative easing that is all the money that's being printed by central banks around the world um, is going to continue in force uh, throughout next year. In fact, there's no signs of, of the spigot uh, closing anytime soon. So that should bode well for hard assets, including precious metals. And it's just a matter of being patient before we see GLD and SLV break out of these long basing patterns that they've formed. These, this kind of basing pattern, the length of this one, is not all that unusual. Um, in the history of gold, it does tend, to, after big run-ups, to base often for several months, if not longer. So we'll just have to be patient and uh, ever watchful for uh, signs of the next breakout. Yeah, that was pretty good, Dr. K. So we thought we'd throw everybody off this morning and, and let Dr. K lead in. Um, I do want to uh, have him... Uh, Get jump in here and, and comment more often so you can look for that we'll try to keep you guys guessing but I'm basically sitting here stuffing my face with uh, gluten-free Christmas cookies so yeah you know it's interesting uh, when we do the uh, when we do this like DTI webinars um, I like how there's sort of a um, everything settles into its own way and I, I like typing to lots of people uh, where while they throw questions at us and you do the speaking and it seems to work really well and I, we never planned that. I mean, we never planned any of this. It actually kind of happened by osmosis. Yeah, but it's, it's good, to, good to change things up every now and then. It it's, uh, makes it uh, makes it more interesting and exciting. Yeah, I like the uh, the shortable gap down breakout in the metals today, which is looking pretty ugly. But it wouldn't surprise me to see the metals, you know, test support somewhere down around fifteen hundred with gold. Which would take you down to the lows of this big base, and it could just—that's all it could be. So, but uh, Dr. K, why do you suppose you're seeing stocks act okay, while uh, the precious metals are getting literally getting pummeled here? What, what do you think is up with that? Well, I, I think you know, gold gold has been a risk on trade. I mean, if if the fiscal cliff issue is going to be a serious one, the, the more serious it gets, uh, the 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 more gold gets propped. I mean, if you look at, uh, for instance, September. Um, as the markets topped, gold uh, GLD continued to hit new highs into early October. There was a lot of concern. Um, I think the market was telegraphing concern about the impending fiscal cliff issue, and therefore the general markets did sell off in mid-September, and then continued to sell off all the way into uh, mid-November. Um, and notice that QE3 um, couldn't 
couldn't save the day. Um, QE1 and QE2 caused nice uh, uptrends in the market, but QE3 has acted differently. Because I right, think the yeah. fiscal cliff overhang is, is, is a real and significant issue. The question is whether the markets right now, since the bounce in mid-November, have priced in a fiscal cliff resolution such that when we do get that good news, uh, the markets might actually sell off, you know, as they say, sell, sell on the news, and we might see a, a temporary sell-off in the markets. Yeah, I think it boils down to whether you see the fiscal cliff as something that once it's resolved, it's going to clear the way for the market, which I have a hard time uh, seeing at this point, or, or whether uh, it's just an alibi, an expectation of a resolution is just an alibi for a rally. Um, what's your take on the general quality of the breakouts that we've seen uh, in certain stocks? Do you see a lot of power? Do you see a lot of thrust? Do you think, see a lot of things you want to just pile into? Well, not not things I'd want to pile into, but we are seeing um, big big cap stocks, super cap stocks like Amazon, um, Oracle, um, Google, that are rounding out their bases and attempt to, you know acting in some ways constructively uh, in this market environment. Uh, I wouldn't buy those names just because they're you know most of those names are just too slow, and uh, the the risk reward is you know not so not favorable enough. But they are an indication that. Things may be uh, on on the mend. Um, in terms of individual names, we've of course written some reports on uh, a couple of these actionable names, but they're still far and few between. We aren't seeing a huge uh, rush of quality names come to the forefront um, that are actionable in this environment as of yet. Yeah, and it seems like what I've noticed. I mean, the way I'm playing this market is, as you can actually see on my screen, I'm actually short um, Apple and CF Industries, which is uh, which is a big fertilizer stock. And I've, I noticed, and we talked about in previous uh, webinars, that Agram has been weak after this basically late stage, you know, failure because the base or whatever it's trying to break out, and then it just blows apart on huge volume and rallies up into the 50-day and begins to roll over. And uh, CF Industries is very similar. In that regard, except it actually tried to rally up and form a little cup and handle and break out, and then you get this massive break, and you already have this huge volume break here in the pattern, and then you get this uh, wedging rally, which to me looks shortable, and of course it is breaking down. But you know, I look around, uh, and you know, I think what's the what was it like three days ago? I think, or it was on uh, yeah, three days ago it was on Tuesday. That remember we put out in our pre-market pulse, and I, some of you may have noticed this, but we did something we we rarely do which is we called a breakout before uh, we actually saw it because the way it looked to us is that the market's acting strong, you got big stocks in position to break out and so we surmise that Amazon might be a go-to name and that's exactly what happened. But what it, but you see what happens here, here's the breakout. I'll actually buy this and you get a nice jack of 3 or 3 4 percent up to like 263 and then it kind of fizzles out and it comes back in and so you can trade that and then if you want to you can come in and try and nibble on some shares but you don't really seem to get a lot of follow through on these breakouts Dr. K. Like, like this one here, this sell chain looked really powerful last week, these look great uh, some of these biotechs here, Gilead doing the same thing and they just kind of flop right back in and they don't go anywhere and then this poly one we pointed out the pocket pivot right here and it doesn't go anywhere, it just kind of flops right back right. in. ISRG as well ISRG, but you know, this was actually a flawed pocket pivot. I thought this is a great example. Here's a pocket pivot here, and that's basically a do not buy. You don't want to buy that sort of pocket pivot. Am, am I correct on that, Dr. K? Right, which is why uh, neither of us uh, put out a report on it. I mean, a lot right. of these reports Definitely. you and I will do independently because we see eye to eye on virtually everything when it comes to, you know, actionable names. And if it's, not, if it's a question, then you'll ask me or, you know, you'll, we'll each confirm with each other if, if it's not solid in our mind that it's actionable. But um, you know, when we do things independently, um, you know, we don't step on each other's toes, and neither of us said anything about ISRG just because it wasn't it wasn't ready yet. Right. In fact, I was trying to short this rally up into the 50-day moving average, and I got blown out pretty quickly, thankfully. But I wish I had. When my alert went off yesterday, I wish I had gone after it right at 5:30 because it hovered right in there about 5:29, 5:30, just for a, a little while. You could have hit it there, and this thing's blown apart. But again, it's showing. Uh, you know the unevenness in the market and so I'm pretty cautious and I, I'm trying not not to take a bullish or bearish sort of mentality uh, and, and just kind of get rigid there. I'm just trying to look at what I see and it seems to me that you can play things on a stock-by-stock -stock basis. If you see a short setup 
in uh, something like this, you go ahead and hit it. If you see a short setup in something like this, you go ahead and hit it and you get some nice movement. You know, you had a breakout here uh, last week, I believe that's on Monday, if I'm or Friday rather, this breaking out uh, from this pattern. And, and we've been watching this big old ugly uh, head and shoulders pattern for a long time in this stock and now you're seeing the breakdown. Do you see how long that takes? So you got to be pounding that thing and of course I had put 36 as a downside target on it myself and that's pretty much hit it but it's moving lower and you know, so a lot of these it's it's a matter of I guess being patient now that brings up you know the big short in my mind which is Apple and you see here that we we're in this sort of head and shoulders left shoulder uh, big head right shoulder here and you got this neckline coming down and you basically bounced off the 500 level and the neckline. So when you undercut, in my view, when once you undercut this low and you did it uh, pretty decisively on Monday, and you also, uh, once that pre-open Dutch K was trading around 498, 496, something like that. And I noticed that, and so that sort of pretty much set it up for a rally. And you could even try and play that on the, on the long side if you're really daring, which I did and, and made a few cents, but not not that much. It's very difficult. To for me to play a bottom fish like that. But you see it coming in and uh, the volume is light today, but we'll see how this pans out. The stock's still pretty weak, I think, and there is potential for it to break out because if you look at something like this, let's say we're looking at this trend line here and you think of this as like a reverse cup and handle. So you want to turn this upside down and look at it in a mirror. You have this gap down breakout here <clears throat> on this day, which was five days ago, that was, would have been last Friday, and then you undercut on Monday and you rally, but you basically rally right back into this uh, sort of breakout, rever inverse breakout point. And so now I think you've got some resistance up in this point, so you can test a short sale along the 10-day moving average and along this trend line. It's not going to be precise. I think you got a percent maybe on either side of that, maybe a little more wiggle room. But it, it, if it does roll over, this thing goes through... Uh, Let's look at a weekly chart here. If this thing goes to the neckline, uh, let me get, I don't know where this line came from, but here's the neckline on this big head and shoulders. You could draw another one here. Now I know where it came from. Draw this other one. This is the other one we're looking at and kind of figure this is a neckline here. But if you head down through these lines, I think, you know, the next stop is down here around 425, 430, and uh, it still looks pretty weak. I'm going to be on Fox Business News tomorrow morning. They're, they're telling me 645 a.m. I would say unless there's some breaking news on the fiscal cliff, they, I won't get bumped. So you'll see me right after the open, pretty much. And uh, they want me to talk about Apple. Some of the things uh, Dr. Ken and I were talking about this morning. One of the things that strikes me about Apple is they, they almost seem to be walking into the same trap that they walked into with PCs. And feel free to interject here, Dr. K, so we can get into something on some nice debate like we did ah, last week. That was good fun. It's good sport, eh? <laughs> uh, yeah, I just I was going to make fun of your jeans uh, this week, but we'll, we'll save that. Um, <laughs> My jeans? I, well, I was going to make fun of your jeans as well, but uh, different, different, different wear, kind of different kind of jeans. <laughs> do you wear the same pants every day? <laughs> and when I say jeans, I think someone some people get that <laughs> reference. <laughs> Anyways, um, Apple. You know, you notice where, where do you see the iOS the the I, you know, the iPhone operating system or whatever you call it, the I, iOS, I guess is what you would call it. Where do you see that on any devices other than Apple devices? Well, none. And back in the 80s, you know, where did you see the Apple uh, PC operating system on other devices? Well, you didn't. You only saw them on Apple devices. So today we see the iOS is only on Apple devices. Meanwhile, Android, which is Google's platform, is coming out on all kinds of devices. And Dr. K, you had some points on that that I thought were pretty salient when we were talking about this this morning. And did you want to kind of review those real quickly? In well, terms sure. Of how um, the Android performs relative to uh, the Apple operating or, or the Apple phones in the operating system? Yeah, sure. I mean, effectively, as we all know, Android is open source. Uh, Apple is closed source. Apple has managed to be a top dog because it had Steve Jobs' genius. He is amazing. He's absolutely beyond brilliant at packaging the product, having it, having the right aesthetics associated with the product, having the right salesmanship in the stores, the right uh, layout in the stores, and of course uh, having first mover advantage toward creating a product that 
is at the top of the pyramid um, in terms of user interface, user built friendliness. And uh, so he was at the right place at the right time with a number of amazing products, which has put Apple into the stratosphere in terms of market cap. Now Steve is he's gone on to better, bigger, better places most likely, and uh, he is no longer there. It would take an equivalent genius to rescue, or I would say, to to uh, manage um, Apple's momentum. You know, the momentum's been fierce. Uh, I, very, very, almost no companies have done. I don't think any company's done what Ad, uh, Apple has done. So the question is: Is there a Steve Jobs waiting the wings, or someone at Apple that's equivalent? that has Steve's forceful personality to get his ideas through, but also has his ability to lay off or lay back when he does see an idea that's better than his. He had, he had the right touch. I've read his biography, and it, it's very clear to me. Uh, there, I, I highly doubt there are any Steve Jobs out there that are, um, can take his place. So it's really going to come down to um, open source architecture. And we see that these applications that exist for the Apple are being overshadowed very quickly by the by the Android applications, and if you look at the best Samsung phone right now, uh, um, I was in, in one of the shops here in London the other day, it's very clear to me that the graphics and the screen size and the, the user interface, everything is, is actually su kind of it's superior to the iPhone 5. Uh, the iPhone 5 still has an edge on overall user experience in terms of the smoothness of the operations and the limited number of bugs and uh, therefore when I upgrade my iPhone 4 uh, probably in the next couple of weeks I will probably get an iPhone 5 however I'm certainly open to the idea of getting one of these top-end Samsung's which uh, I think are equivalently priced but offer a, a whole treasure tro uh, trove of additional uh, useful um, features my big issue, I think, with, and everyone's big issue, has been the bugs and the interface, but those are being smoothed out rapidly because of the open source architecture. And there's no doubt in my mind, in about a year's time, everyone, I, I, I certainly know if I get an iPhone 5 now, my next phone after the iPhone 5 will not be an Apple phone. Open source always wins in the end. Yeah, I noticed, remember when we were in Vegas this last go-around in May, uh, in November, rather, uh, one of the... Uh, guys were having dinner with one night. He had one of these big screen Samsungs, and I got to say, uh, you know, as you get older, for those of you who are over 50 or somewhere around there, you some of you may notice that uh, your your reading vision starts to diminish, and I think a lot of the baby boomers getting there make some of these bigger screens more popular. Interesting that Apple comes out with a new iPad Mini with a smaller screen, but most people I, I talk to, they they like or who have these Samsung phones, they like the bigger screen because of the readability. So, uh, you know, so, so I think Apple's basically walking into the same trap that they did in the 80s. And I, I've talked about this before, but I worked at uh, on a design team at, at the learning company, the old learning company started by Ann Pystrup back in the 80s that developed Reader Rabbit and uh, Math Rabbit. We were working on a game, Robot Odyssey, back then. Uh, that was pretty successful, but we designed all our games first for the Apple platform, and, and the DOS or the IBM platform, as we called it, uh, was our you know was the second thought, or the afterthought rather. And uh, and but you know Microsoft won that battle because there were so many devices with uh, their operating system versus uh, Apple being so proprietary, and so that's probably uh, what Apple's walking into today. That's what it seems like. So. Yeah, I mean, Apple, um, it, it really, for Apple to maintain itself, it really has to come out with another game-changing device. And I don't really see that happening. I mean, the, the, the playing field is as competitive as it gets. So uh, if there is some brilliant-minded Apple that has come up with, you know, something that uh, we haven't heard of, there's going to be someone else, somewhere else in the world, at Samsung or any of these other companies that, could uh, have an equal chance of coming up with such a phenomenal idea and executing yeah. that idea. Now, that, that, hey, but somebody makes a point, and I think it's a pretty good point, that you know, Linux was, was open source. Microsoft Windows is not open source. Would you agree with that? Well, Linux is open source, completely open source, um, and it has never really gotten off the ground. I, th I think the timing, it was a very much a timing issue because 
to have something open source to make it work. Like I'll give you an example. Um, something like Wikipedia. Well, you really needed the you needed you know a platform like the internet. You couldn't Wikipedia would never would have really gone anywhere in back in the old days with the ARPANET, even though it was open source. It right, was, right. It's open source. It just it was ahead of its time if that were the case. Um, and it was at the right place at the right time. I think Linux is just uh, early. It's too early. And I think you know open source is certainly manifesting across many platforms now. Uh, Microsoft back in the day uh, just had that added advantage because it, uh, it 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 did enough that was not open source to to just get it into the uh, mainstream. And then um, often you know its its products were full of bugs and, uh, and people would be very frustrated. But nevertheless. They were very good at, um, at at getting the product out there, and then having. They, they were certainly more open source than um, than say Apple Computer. Apple right. Apple's always been a closed source environment, whereas Microsoft right. had more, much more sharing going on. And I think that combination of sharing in Microsoft um, was what helped it gain uh, traction in the marketplace. Whereas Linux, on the other hand, was just pure open source and a bit ahead of its time, and it needed it really needed more. Direction, you know, it needed more of a Bill Gates at the helm to uh, to really expand it out, and there was no one to do that at the time. Yeah, I, I really think the crux of it of that whole thing, this open source, is is really that Microsoft allowed their uh, operating system on devices made by a variety of manufacturers, and so that created a, a variety of, of uh, PCs and devices one could buy, and the consumer liked that, so that's where they gravitated. Whereas now you see. Android on a number of devices, a lot more, of course, than Apple with just the iPhone and, and their own products, and I think that's where they missed the boat. So you know, we'll see how it goes. All we know for now is the stock's looking still weak on an intraday basis. Here's your five-minute, you know, six, the famous 620 chart, whatever you want to call it, and you had a sell signal early this morning, pre-open, stock opened up. They had around 5.30, and it came in pretty quickly right around the opening and seems to be continuing lower. So we'll just see how this one plays out. I'm basically using a, you know, my stop's probably going to be if this thing turns back and gives me a buy signal because I'm, I'm on this and I went, I got short these two stocks, CF and uh, Apple uh, yesterday on the on the weakness. So, um, let's go through some questions. I mean, you know, what is looking good out there? Some of the breakouts. I think probably one of the more controversial uh, things out there is that Commvault is an ascending base. And you know, I don't know. You got one pullback, you got two pullbacks, and I only see two pullbacks unless you're counting this as the first pullback, and then a move up, and another pullback. I mean, to me, I just see this as a breakout from a one, two, three, four, five, six-week base. So I don't really see this as the start of a of a an ascending base. The way I would look at this is I would need to see another pullback because you usually get three pullbacks, and the patterns generally tend to be nine. To I think twenty something weeks long, and this one is really only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven weeks long, unless you're counting this pullback. So, you know, I don't know. I, this this business of of trying to label bases, I, I think, doesn't really help. And I think it's a much more elegant and simplified system to use pocket pivots and viable gap ups as your buying guides. And when you look at Commvault, first of all, we can see this was a very clear breakout here. And then we saw this. This is actually a weird little pocket pivot in a V-shaped formation, though, because this blue volume right here was higher than any down volume over the prior 10 days. So you have this little sort of gap up pocket pivot above the 10-day moving average, but it's a little bit V-shaped, so it has to back down and kind of correct itself. Then you get another pocket pivot that's a breakout. So you don't really need to argue about whether this is an ascending base or a, a cup of the hand or whatever it is. What you see is in the technical action, the daily chart, you can see a, a possible buy point here, but it needs to come in to correct this sort of V-shapedness. And then you get a pocket pivot here that can be bought and actually holds the 10-day. You have a dip below here, but you're not really using the 10-day as your selling guide. You'd be using the 50-day as your selling guide. And then you see you get another uh, pocket pivot move here. That's a breakout from this little you know, two, three-week flag formation on the daily chart. You see the market starting to get a little bit weaker here, which I'm okay with, being short and all. Uh, but you know, so now you're breaking. So you could buy again here if you wanted to. You don't have to worry about whether this is an ascending base or not. I, I tend to think it's not. How about you, Dr. K? Well, it's. I mean, ascending bases are tricky. Really, what you want to see is um, a market that's in a, a flat to, to downward trend, and the, and while the stock. Somehow manages like a trout swimming upstream. Right, that's a key key characteristic that you don't see here, right? 
Right. The trout. I, I, actually, it just came to me. It's just. It's. Uh, that's what it is. It's a trout swimming up upstream, and I think that yeah. helps people. That'll help people visualize what ascending bases are supposed right. to be. Right. And this is a trout swimming downstream, basically, because the market's been moving up as this thing has been forming this ascending base. Generally, a strong ascending base is indicated when a stock is doing this during a bear market or a sideways market. So. I don't see, you know, we both of us do not believe this is an ascending base. And whoever wrote that, I think they're probably new, at, relatively new at IBD, and they don't have a lot of experience with it. It's not, you know, the material is not that easy to grasp. I remember when I was at O'Neill, even institutional investors, you're trying to explain to them the essence of some of these chart patterns and some of the technical action. It's just like going over their head, like nobody's business. So, you know, I don't fault any IBD writer. It's particularly if they knew, they're new, and I, I think one of Bill's flaws is that he doesn't develop any people long term. If you start moving up too far in that organization, you get punted some way, and that that seems to be the pattern, or you get sh shunted off to uh, some some place else. What uh, what what the wider is seeing is he's seeing the October action, that brief yeah. October action. Um, if that was spread out over the next you know the next month or the month before then that would constitute a, an ascending base but unfortunately right. the month after and the month before the markets were in, was in an uptrend or you know the months prior to that so it, it's, right. it really doesn't constitute it doesn't qualify right and then you got to take it you know take into account that it's probably an inexperienced writer who's relatively new or really doesn't trade that much you know so well it's, it's also possible it's an experienced writer who's just kind of you know, what didn't have his eye on the ball and just, you know, had maybe had a deadline to make and just didn't look at the chart. I don't know. That properly. sounds like that's that's troubling. An experienced writer who doesn't really know what he's talking about. Okay. Because that's a pretty key point point as far as I know, ascending bases. And I remember Bill showing those to me in ninety eight and ninety nine. Uh, he showed me some in Home Depot, I believe it was one that was one of the early models for the so called ascending base. And I think IBM even had one back in the '60s, and so we were looking at a few of those at that time. Uh, and and uh, the key point was always: here's a stock that's trying to go higher as the market is either going nowhere or going lower. And you, and you, you all you see here is a stock going higher while the market's going higher. So big deal. Anyways, the Mayans were very smart planning uh, the end of the world on a triple triple witching Friday. Yeah, I, I don't know. I do, the end of the world, I don't know. That, is that what, what's going to happen tomorrow? I'm going to be on Fox, so I guess that'll be a good place for it. Uh, let's see, MTZ. Yeah, I've been watching this. And the other one is American Tower, or is it AMT? I think it is. You know, These are basically, I believe, uh, cell phone tower companies, and so it's acting well. But you know, if you want to buy, we talked about this before. If you want to buy, go ahead. But I'm not, I don't get really excited about these, so... NSM is a short. Uh, I'm not really seeing any weakness yet. It's moving above the 50-day, so it's into resistance here. It does have this look, whoa, of kind of a head and shouldersy type thing. But I, I don't know. A lot of the Fed policies are propping the mortgage market. I'm not quite sure the dynamics of that. I'm not so sure I'd want to short that one. NSM isn't that big of a stock. Priceline, I, I actually did short it yesterday off the peak. Because uh, I saw it moving into sort of this area in here of, of resistance, and it did reverse, and uh, I did cover it just to take a quick, you know, profit there, a quick uh, instant uh, short-term trade there, just just scalp a few bucks. Uh, it it got back above the 50-day moving on really no 50-day moving average on really no volume, and now it's pulling back, and you know I can't tell you whether this is uh, heavy volume. Uh, you're not really seeing any heavy volume break. I think if you did break down, you, you could hit it. But I was much more uh, amenable to shorting it up up on this bump, three days up, and that's usually where I look at hitting them. I was looking at, at you know three days up on Apple, but it never really got there, and so I thought that was a sign of weakness. I would have thought if you undercut, you should have had more of uh, of a bounce there. The I search pocket pivot was not correct because it's you're in a downtrend first of all. And it occurs off this V-shaped formation, so you can see this V-shaped thing here and and here. So you see that, and this is V-shaped, and you're also in a downtrend. So you're not. You want to see these pocket pivots when you see them. I get to remove all this stuff here. When you see them, you want to see them coming out of a position more like, say, this. You know, USG. It's it's coming up a little bit. It's kind of wedging a little bit, but that's not actually a good example. But that's also a cautionary one. But racks, you know, this is a decent pocket pivot here. 
Uh, this is a breakout, so you're not really too concerned with this. It's not. Eh, it's hard to say whether that's really wedging or not. If this fails, you know, in hindsight, you'll say it's wedging. Dr. K, you don't see this as a wedging rally from here to here, do you? Well, I mean, you know, you, the wedge is is defined as uh, higher prices on lower volume. You know, it forms a trend, and that so you have that wedge. Um, I yeah, no, I don't. I wouldn't say that's quite a wedge. It's okay, very, how about this one? Big. How about this one? Uh, so you mean the, the last, the last? Uh, in, you mean the December there? Yeah, well, right here. Yeah, what this has been doing in the first part of December. Before yeah, this the price action is pretty lackluster. Um, the volume is also pretty tame, though. So. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, that that's a mild. It's a mild wedge, I would say. Yeah, so I think the not key... constructive price action, to be sure. You don't want to see prices doing that with wider bars and moving higher. That's that's generally that kind of action often needs to correct itself. In this case, it didn't need to. But then uh, also the volume was pretty light on those days. You know, they were right. trading below average, so I guess it didn't really need to correct that. Right, and you're. Uh... But you got a breakout, you know, and you're seeing breakouts in some of these building and uh, home-related names, such as, say, Ryland was another one. I think that's probably the stronger one. There was another. I think it was MDC was the other one. No, that's not it. Which is the other one breaking out? Not Pulte. Yeah, that was breaking out too. Which one? Yeah. Oh, Ellie. This is another. This is a pocket pivot. It's out of a downward, downward trend there. Yeah. So it's breaking out through this lower part of it, but you know, it's kind of uh, I don't know. I'd rather be short Apple and CF today. You know, they're they're <laughs> that's how I feel about it. And if you were able to jump on something like this earlier, and you got you know five, six, seven percent on, I don't know, I'd take it in this environment. I don't trust this environment myself, and uh, the short side has worked out okay. But I think you have to pick on you know what are really big stock. Uh, short sale targets. There are a lot of uh, ugly looking patterns, but I think you got to figure out uh, which ones are most optimal. And the bigger they are, the harder they fall. So, so anyways, but that's all. You know why why uh, I surge was an improper pocket pivot. I thought Regeneron was looking pretty good the other day, and you know holding in tight. And now after all this action, here it comes right back for the 50 day. So it's coming back to this breakout point, but. You know, straight down, straight up, and it's probably got to pull back at least. But I'm not really interested in buying this action. Uh, Doctor, I know you've liked this name, and it's been a favorite of yours. What's your take on it right now? Well, it's uh, having a pullback to its 50-day moving average. Um, you know, it has managed to to do well um, in the face of downtrending markets. But the uptrend uptrend is is on the slower side these days. Um, I, I don't know. It's still the price action is still. You know, it's still pretty good in this name, and you can see that if you did buy it uh, earlier on, um, it, it tends to violate the 50-day, unfortunately, which means you, you know you're going to tend to get forced out of the stock, um, and it might very well violate the 50-day again. And, and this kind of name becomes very hard to trade and 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 hold for long periods because of that that uh, that the nature of this of the way it trades uh, price-wise around these moving averages. I mean, in general, when I see a stock that does this, you know, it's violating, it's violated the 50-day twice in the last six months, uh, I often will not buy it because it's going to probably do it again and force me out. All right, I'm just piling through. Uh, somebody's asking me, and I wanted to ask you this too, where, where is the pocket pivot in this one? I didn't really see it the other day. I mean, I saw this, this volume move, which are extended from the 10-day moving average, so I would think uh, that's the uh, other where. Yeah, no, the, the pocket pivot really, um, it was, uh, first of all, a lower bar close on um, December 18th, yeah, and uh, really it's a combination of the overall chart uh, that it you know, it's virtu it, it's basically coming out of this little pattern. You know, you could call it a, a, a minor breakout together with a pocket pivot. It, when you have breakout and pocket pivot together, the pocket pivot can be a little extended from the moving average, and um, and that that extension can be forgiven. But that said, it was a weak close, um, and uh, that was the only day uh, that there was any sort of pocket pivot. So it has to be handled carefully. Uh, the story behind this company is compelling. Um, but also the other issue with this company is that it has never doubled in price. You, you know, generally speaking, every stock that I will buy, unless it's an IPO, um, it better have proven itself already, and this one hasn't yet. So yeah, it, it really looks like it could be a laggard, 
Um, and if any position is taking, it really should be you know no more than a half position. So, uh, so wasn't Michael Kors a pocket pivot on uh, on Tuesday? I would say uh, the same thing here. You got a, a V-shaped sort of move back above the 50-day. So this one isn't really ripe. You got any comments on this, Dr. K? Yeah, it's just uh, it doesn't look right. It's a little little raw still, and it, it needs to uh, issue another pocket pivot after some uh, further constructive price volume action, and then I might get interested in in this in the in the stock because in the this defect, overall chart defect, will have uh, redeemed itself. Yeah, I mean, you basically are still running a base under a base, so I don't, I don't know. This has got. It, this probably needs more time. Maybe this is constructive in the broader scheme of things, but I think it needs more time. Um, somebody's sound, telling me that Celgene was an ascending base. Uh, where? And that that's being identified. Somebody's saying that's being identified. I, I don't. I don't see it, so I don't know. But I can tell you one thing that I know from having worked at O'Neill. When I was there, we were working on a base recognition project, and we had some PhD whizzes, uh, math whizzes in there, trying to program a uh, software that would uh, recognize bases. And what what I discovered uh, in the beta tests of this is that, yeah, the program recognizes all these bases, but it, it's often wrong, and it often over recognizes bases. In other words, it sees something there that's not really there and so it's it's very difficult there is a I think a judgmental factor in assessing these bases I don't see anywhere where there's an ascending base in this pattern do you Dr. K? No I, I, there is not in fact um, back in 19 I think it was 1998 um, uh, O'Neill wanted me and Rajneesh to work together on, on, a, on a program that would identify bases and we just it never really got off the ground. We found there was just too many um, conditional issues that would come up, and and how do you yeah. program that into code? Uh, you can't think of all the different possibilities. It, you know, the the best you can do is a is create a very crude representation of a basing pattern. You know, of a program that that uh, signals basing patterns. But then, I would say, you know, doing it manually is is just going to be a faster way anyway than having some program uh, do it for you. I mean, I guess you could. We, we use screens to whittle the list down. The problem is that since context has to be taken into account, um, that makes it very tricky for a, a program to uh, understand that, that context. Because that, yeah. that's, that's along the lines of artificial intelligence. And certainly in 98, uh, if AI was nowhere near what, what, uh, what, we, what was required for the task. Yeah, exactly. And so you know, I, don't, I wouldn't put a lot of stock in that sort of stuff, uh, face recognition. You know, it, I think it's more confusing than anything. Someone's asking, is Baidu a short? I think it's a short at the 50-day and up around this 100 area where you have long-term resistance. I suppose it could rally a little bit, but I do think it's a short. It was yesterday at the 50-day. Another one that did the same thing was Alexion bumped right into it. You can see the 50-day crossing below. You got this big head and shoulders formation. So that one looks weak too. So yeah, I think as they rally up into those moving averages, they're testable. Now that the thing is, Sometimes they just keep going through, and they can go two or three percent past uh, the moving average, and then roll over. So you kind of have to work with that, and, and sort of be willing to move with the stock. Somebody asks, "What do you think of Home Depot?" I'm not a buyer, and I'm not going to short it. So, but I do notice some of these building-related things, like LL, also lumber liquidators, they're not acting so well. Isn't there a lot of discretion in both your and O'Neill's interpretation of most of these stocks? Well, in terms of interpreting bases, there, there's a fair bit of discretion and judgment involved. But I think the, the beauty of using pocket pivots and, and viable gap pivots, in other words, concrete buy points, rather than relying on the shape of a base or what you can label it, you know, or what you think it is, I, I don't think that's necessarily as uh, useful or as consistent as just operating on the basis of pocket pivots and viable gap ups. So, yeah. Although you still need uh, you still need to bring you know a wealth of experience to to the table um, in in terms of um, evaluating price volume action leading up to that pocket pivot, which is why most pa pocket pivots don't make the cut. And, and so yeah. you know I, I think I've said this before. There's there there's um, you know the wealth of experience that someone brings you know who's been doing this for say 20 years successfully or or longer. Uh, that is an incredibly um, powerful and important aspect to uh, one's success uh, in terms of identifying um, uh, proper pocket pivots, proper buy points. Uh, I remember back in the day at O'Neill, I would I, um, we were we were responsible for you know providing um, stock ideas for him, 
and uh, he would veto quite a number of them on the basis of yeah. the de defective basis. And I learned a lot from that process because I, I wouldn't see the defect until he would point it out. And then over the years, you just get better and better at being able to sift through a stack of charts and say, okay, out of this 100, 100 charts, there's only two I like. You know, as opposed to before, where I might like have like eight or nine of them, and O'Neill, of course, would veto you know most of them in that in that situation. It was a great learning experience, and I think everyone you know should should carry charts around so they can acclimate their eye to to what uh, you know what constitutes proper versus improper. And in our, our next book, the one that's launching uh, shortly, um, you know, we have uh, a, many many exercises that will train the readers to chart eye. So um, you know, we take them through through the process of of um, of what we've done ourselves over many years. Yeah, and of course we get the question, you know, what's different about this book? I don't, nothing. We just re reproduced the whole book, so we're hoping you're all dumb enough to buy it uh, on that basis. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty much all all new stuff. So, and more much more detail. So. I hate to be facetious, but you know, I could mock that uh, being offended by a question like that. As if, oh, do you think we would uh, just duplicate our prior book? No, this book uh, was actually born out of our experience after writing the first book and after launching the website and what we run into in terms of the questions that come up and the, the areas where people have difficulty in understanding. So uh, that's kind of what this book addresses, as well as a number of other topics that have come up. Uh, that we decided to cover in detail. You know, a lot of trading psychology, uh, how you should handle your your monitor setups, and how that can affect your sales, stuff like that. Um, and we also did a a post analysis of 2011. So, let's see. Oh, okay, not a cell gene ascending base CVLT. Yeah, we already talked about that. It doesn't. I don't know. I haven't looked at Market Smith. Someone's asking, have they solved the problem with uh, the base recognition? I just don't think it's really that useful, you know. But but it's something that can be solved because people will will buy into it because most people have trouble recognizing bases. I think our method, using pocket pivots and Bible gap ups, just eliminates the whole need to uh, identify and label bases. I think. Someone's asking, uh, I've been learning with you guys for almost a year, and while I haven't done well this year, I haven't gotten clobbered either. What were your first years like? How long did it take you to feel comfortable with this type of trading? I would say it took me two to three years. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Ted's probably similar, or, or maybe you were an instant prodigy. No, the first, the first is, year, uh, it's funny because the first year um, after I read O'Neill's book in 89 and that first year I just thought a lot of his stuff was arbitrary. <laughs> I had been jaded because of the books I'd read and the market seemed very contradictory and I, I, not, none, none of the systems seemed to work very well and so I approached O'Neill's book with with, um, with a lot of skepticism and what, what kept me going though I, was uh, the fact that he had the track record he did so I knew that statistically um, he's got something under his belt and then of course David Ryan also repeating, being able to reproduce his track record in his own account. And I, I said, okay, there's got to be a method to the madness. And so I carried around a daily graph with me wherever I went. And for the next year, I was start studying charts and just trying to make a sense of, uh, of what, what seemed very arbitrary at the time. Um, and then after about a year, uh, you know, the, 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 the dots connected in my head. And I almost got in a car accident. It's funny because I just pulled over to the side of the road, grabbed the chart book, and started plumbing through it. Because I, I don't know, it's just one of those uh, eureka moments that I get it. And that was a very exciting period for me. And then 1991 was my first good year in the market as a result of um, having integrated the ideas in uh, O'Neill's uh, How to Make Money in Stocks. Arm H, uh, John, that's not a, I wouldn't buy that. You're, there's no volume on the breakout. So you answered your own question there. Uh, does ML on X look like a short? We talked about this one up, up in here. And, uh, you know, I couldn't borrow shares. That was a few weeks ago. You can go back and look on some of the old videos. I think we talked about that. Uh, is it a short from here? You're breaking down. You know, hit. You're right on top of this area. I'd look for some kind of a bounce. I don't think I'd be shorting it. I'd be looking for something else. It's pretty ugly though. But you got, you know, this is really where to come after it in here. At least on the break of the 200-day moving average initially, and, and now it's heading lower. Oh, Dr. K, you get to answer questions on the UVXY model. Anything exciting going on? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, like I said, it's it seems to be uh, 
proving out more or less. Um, but you know, again, it's going to be volatile, so you you got to you got to be careful the way you handle um, this type of model. You know, the the right now the uh, the VIX and these uh, volatility indicators seem to want to rise easily with this very minor pullback in the market. But um, again, that that doesn't affect the model. It doesn't it doesn't influence it out of its current uh, signal. Uh, which is which is uh, a sell signal on these instruments. Um, it's not. Uh, sometimes it will look for very small um, aberrations, but right now, it uh, it's more is looking actually for a, kin a continued downtrend in uh, UVXY and uh, instruments like VXX. In other words, it's it's seeing a higher likelihood that the markets will continue their uptrend uh, that started a few weeks ago. So until it stops seeing that, or until the failsafe is hit. Uh, it's going to remain on its current signal. Let's see. Somebody says, do you recommend getting market sense weekly chart service where they give you updated charts on a weekly basis? I don't know anything about it, so I could not tell you. Somebody says our book's already out and they're reading it on Kindle. Right. Is there any advantage buying your new book on an e-reader over a hardcover? Um, no, there's only an advantage if you buy both. How's that? Does Dr. K use sentiment indicators in his timing model? No, it, well, not that's those are purely secondary indicators, which mean they're they don't carry much weight. I mean, it really comes down to price volume action of major indices and leading stocks. And there's a couple supplementary things, but uh, um, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. If if for instance the model was on neutral. And we got a huge spike in, um, you know, put put the call ratio, or you know, huge spike in one of these sentiment indicators that um, was record setting or near record setting. The model will take that into account, of course. I mean, because that that's valuable data. But uh, most of the time, that these uh, indicators, sentiment indicators, are secondary because they're not going to hit those, you know, record levels or near record levels. So the model then is going to weigh absolute price volume action um, much more heavily. As a, as a result. You know, I had a question for you. Uh, you are calling the other day uh, in the NASDAQ a follow-through day, so it would have been this day here. And we were up a little over 1.3%, so that implies to me that you've lowered the threshold percentage move for a follow-through day to 1.3%. Yes, I was, uh, down uh, from 1.4%. Uh, uh, for the benefit of our uh, listeners, uh, what is the basis of that? Uh, it's based on ATR, and that ATR in uh, the NASDAQ or the S&P 500, um, since threshold levels are used for both, um, that ATR generally has to stay at that new level for at least, and, and when I say new level, it's the average, of course, I'm taking an average, but it has to stay at that new average for uh, at least three months. So in practice, the... Um, the threshold levels of my model um, change infrequently. I mean, for example, uh, from uh, basically from uh, um, April, this is April of uh, this year till just recently, so we're, we're looking at about uh, eight months, uh, the NASDAQ threshold level is 1.4 percent. So just recently um, it's changed, it's lowered to 1.3 percent. S&P meanwhile stays at 1.3 percent. Right, okay. Um, some people say Amazon says they'll ship the hard copy book in one week. So I haven't seen any copies myself yet. So, but I'm too busy stuffing my face with Christmas cookies right now to really worry about any of those sorts of things. Uh, some more questions from people. Uh, we talked about Baidu. We talked about Home Depot. We talked about Silica. Uh, we we did have one on uh, IPG. I think it's IPG Group or IPG. No, IPG Photonics and. Uh, there is, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. I guess you could say you had a pocket pivot move here and it's continuing to move higher. So I don't know. That, what Was there some reason why we didn't like this? Earnings are kind of tepid, 23%. Yeah, I don't, it doesn't, you know, next quarter's earnings up 13%. I don't, to me, it, to us, it seems kind of marginal. It is moving back up. But it had a gap just, down also after earnings. That's that's a really yeah. that's a big flaw in the pattern. Um, that that makes me very uninterested. Um, and it just happened. So, in other words, uh, when one shoe drops, the other the other can drop as well in in a matter yeah. of you know weeks. So uh, it's it's highly suspect. 
which e-signal package do you use? Do you have? People are saying, I don't know. I think I have 10 point something. I don't like the new one, uh, which you know has more uh, black backgrounds and the charts look. Do I, I don't really care much for it. So, but you yeah, know, I've been hearing that that Trade Station is better. So it's possible at some point I may may migrate over to that. But uh, we like e-signal. I like the old version. You know, I, I yeah. we even use an older version of Wanda. We haven't upgraded the last two versions. Because it mainly seems like they're just updating nothing really that that works. Someone's asking, what was the uh, entry price on the VXX since you gave an after-hours uh, buy signal? Is that right? Was yeah, it a buy it, signal or it, it was a sell signal? If the if the um, I've sent this note so right out there. Uh, You're talking ago. three days ago, right here, where it was down and, and now it's rallied back up in everybody's face. Is that it? Yeah, that's right. Um, so basically, the, if the signal comes after, right after the close, or you know, within within you know after hour after market trading hours, then um, I take that closing price. And um, if it if it's after that period, then I'm going to take the next day's opening price, and that just keeps it a little more consistent. I mean, yeah, there's going to be some discrepancy, but I find that over time the discrepancies on the plus or the minus side tend to wash out. We used to take the next day's opening price. Uh, what, what was it? I think. Uh, we used to take the prior day's closing price regardless, um, and that created, uh, in, in prior years, it was a washing out effect of pluses and minuses, but in uh, the last couple of years, it's created, because of the gap down, gap up nature of the environment we're in, it's, it could create um, much more pronounced discrepancies over a short period of time, which is why moving to this uh, new paradigm of taking the price um, either closing price or next day's opening price uh, seems to iron out uh, the discrepancies. Somebody asked about Yum, and uh, Yum, uh, you know, here's a, a good example of a stock that has a big gap down on a failure. So if you look at it on the weekly chart, uh, you know what? I'm over here on the Nasdaq chart, which I don't need to be on. Let's go over here. So here you have this big volume breakdown and a rally back up into the 50-day, and that that actually could be shorted if you see that happening. It's wedging right into the line there, and it's come down three days. So that's a nice breakdown here, and it's looking to me like it wants to break out to the downside. So I'd watch for a breakdown through here, the lows through here, around 65, 66, maybe as low as, yeah, 65, 66 roughly. And uh, that looks pretty ugly to me, a big sort of pod-like structure after a long run. And breaking down, so that's a potential uh, target. You know, but looking either looking for a rally here or a breakout through the through uh, support along the lows here, that would be the way I would handle that. Um, let's see, URI is one everybody's asking. Strong stock, it's United Rentals. Uh, you know, I, I don't see this as a dynamic situation. I know it's been trending higher. It's a very ugly kind of. You know, long-term chart on this thing. They're growing earnings pretty well. I think you know people have been moving into or moving their stuff into storage and, and moving out of houses, and I think that's possibly benefited from there. To me, it, to me, that's just kind of like uh, you know, someone last week mentioned Hertz. Is yeah, they're acting okay. They're moving higher, but I don't really see them as major leaders that I need to be jumping all over right now. Um, we're looking for stocks that have the potential to go 50 to 100 percent higher, and if you look at something and you can't really see that happening or you don't really see the fundamental uh, impetus or, or the compelling fundamental uh, or product cycles and whatnot you know that can drive it higher a lot something like an Apple uh, it doesn't really attract us and I think that's why you know I kind of lump these in so now now watch they'll all double so now that I've said that uh, let's see anything else here ACAM that always gets people uh, asking questions, uh, we've seen this thing, you know, before trying to come higher, you get a big cup with a handle. It doesn't really go anywhere. It's it's trying to come out of this base, so of course you've broken out and you're just holding up. You know, they're basically server farms, I believe. Is that what these guys would do? Yeah. And, uh, you know, Rax has been very popular. There's a, a uh, rumor that Cisco is going to buy them out. And that seems to be holding up. That's what got the stock going the other day. But you saw pocket pivots on that earlier. But I guess A cam, would you put it in that that uh, camp, Dr. K? Well, you know, I had a gap up um, after its recent earnings report, report, and then had another gap up. So that's very powerful in the pattern. And, and then actually, it's had three gap ups, uh, two related to er good earnings reports. Um, so that that's pretty powerful. And I'm just looking at the weekly when it pulls up. Finally, looking um, at what Akamai. Yeah, Akamai. Um, 
And my wand is now is jammed, of course. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm staring at the daily, and it, wand is not responding whatsoever. I'm going to use. Okay, back mine is here. working fine, but you can see here on east signal, you know, you're coming out of this uh, base, and so you, you know, you're not maybe just barely out of range of the buy point if you wanted to buy it. But I think that's probably moving. Rax is moving. Amazon is moving. You know, all of these are similar in terms of uh, the cloud and, and uh, capacity on the cloud. So, oh, you know what? You never answered that question. What was the entry price on uh, on the VIX sell signal? It was the closing price of that day. Or, uh, yeah. So it, it would have been uh, twenty eight fifty. Whatever, whatever that was. Um, yeah, and you pretty much opened the next day right at it. So if you're executing order, you got hit right there. So you you got knocked on all of this. So. Um, I don't know. I don't really care much for that kind of move. But we already argued about models last week. Um, Strategies. Or stra I'm sorry. No, thingies. Yeah, that's right. In thingies. your new book, you mentioned the usefulness of using a trading blotter. Are there any that will record your uh, trades in real time? You know, all, all I do is I go, if I want to look at what we're doing and say, our fund or managed accounts, all I have to do is go online to the broker and, and download a... Uh, Spreadsheet that shows all the trades, and that's generally what what I do. You know, I don't keep a blotter in real time because it's done for you if you're trading on any online platform. And and it's like you know, uh, you know, you programs to do it. It's like anything you know where you could you could use a just a piece of paper and a notebook and write down your your trades. So there's nothing that works anything better or worse than anything else. Any big theme ideas? Uh, cloud seems to be acting better. 3D printing. Some I don't really see any big theme ideas. I don't understand where the themes come from in this environment. So I still think Apple is a nice thematic short. So that's pretty much it. But I don't. I don't have any big theme ideas. You've seen housing act better. Uh, you've seen uh, you know hospitals have acted better. Some uh, airlines have acted better. Um, you know coming up. Uh, what other airlines have been acting? Uh, Ryanair, is that one? What is that? R A A A, right? Uh, R I no A A Y. Is that it? Yeah, there we go. R yeah, R Y A. Yeah, I mean it's a thinner one. So you've seen some of these act better, but it, to me it seems like it's somewhat rotational. I would definitely avoid uh, stuff stocks. They seem to be getting hit, and I, I noticed the DBC. If you look at the Dun and Bradstreet Commodity Index ETF power shares. That's in a downtrend, and with gold and silver weak, you know that's why I thought CF is probably a decent short here, uh, wedging up into the 50-day. So, I mean, there's some companies acting okay. You know, is there any reason why we're not highlighting the Russell 2000? Do you really, you know, need to? I don't know. You know, the Russell 2000 is acting pretty well. Does that tell you that? We're in a great new growth phase, or does it tell you that there's high amount of speculation in the market? I don't know. I just look at the stocks, and if they tell me to buy them, I'll buy them. If they tell me to short them, I'll short them. Um, isn't fracking a big theme? I don't necessarily know that fracking is a big theme. Uh, there have been some names that are involved in that, like SLCA, you know, of course. Whoops. What am I? I'm doing this again. <clears throat> Hello, come in. Okay, there we go. You know, but where is that going today? So I, you know, I don't really see anything that's very wildly compelling. Uh, and I wonder if the Russell is doing better, like I said, because of uh, more speculation coming into the market, and whether that's a good or bad sign. I don't know. I just go with what the stocks are telling me, and uh, it's a bit of a mixed message. And like I said earlier, I'm not really trying to operate on the, the basis of being bullish or bearish. I'm just looking at what charts show me and then trading those moves and generally I'm just looking to swing trade all uh, right now I have a hard time seeing a long-term trend developing what's your synopsis and wrap-up Dr. K sorry you, you were blanking out uh, just repeat the last last thing you said uh, it's probably the same internet that's clogging up your wanna but it basically I'm not approaching the market necessarily as, as a bear or a bull I'm just looking at individual stocks and Hitting chart patterns where I see, uh, you know, tradable setups, and that's basically what what I'm operating on. Yeah, I don't really... you have to do that in this kind of environment. I mean, it's we've been stuck in this trendless malaise for really the last two years, um, and you know, any weekly chart of it, like say the Nasdaq, um, points right to that 
fact that you know makes this the most challenging two years uh, I think in decades. Um, I would say I don't think it. I, I I'm very well aware of it. Um, so these periods, you know, they always come to an end. So it's just a matter of patience, and in the meantime, uh, take it on a stock by stock basis. Uh, don't get married to anything, and um, you know, new trends begin when we uh, least expect. That's true. So you keep that one in mind too. And I guess right now, nobody really believes that the market has any ability to mount a, a rally, any meaningful rally. And I'm skeptical myself, just based on uh, what I'm seeing in in terms of uh, laying the groundwork for economic growth in 2013 and I think what you've got going on here could potentially just turn out to be a rally that is using a fiscal cliff resolution as an alibi and this sucks people in and of course you have the seasonal uh, updrift and favorability there working in the market's favor so you know like I said I'm just gonna go uh, and play it on a stock by stock basis and hopefully I can make some progress that way um, and that's pretty much it so anyways we've gone over basically everything that's going on in this market. I know financials have been acting well uh, and I think that's because you know the too big to fail banks are all being going to be further supported by the Fed buying up mortgage-backed securities, buying up treasuries. I think the, the amount that the Fed is doing on an annual basis pretty much sops up all of the new issuance coming out uh, in 2013 as the Fed continues to buy up all of the treasuries and all the debt that's issued by the government so one hand continues to borrow from the other hand while that hand is vigorously printing money in one shape or another, one form or another, whether it's zeros on a on a computer screen or, or actually running a money printing press. That's really what's going on. And the question is whether that can continue to drive a rally. That's always a potentiality, but I would think I would if that were going to occur, I would expect to see gold and silver and commodities doing much better, and they seem to be uh, lagging here and that's very puzzling so you know it's one cautionary flag possibly but again you know if you're going to come in and buy something uh, you know if you're going to come in and buy these pocket pivots and you're up you're doing okay you can hang out use your stocks if you want to do what I'm doing which is I'll buy these and then boom be out of them after a three-day move uh, that's kind of how I operate uh, in this sort of environment then that's a possibility too but do what suits your taste if you feel that there isn't enough footing here for a sustained bull market and you're having some trouble then you could just always stay in cash that's a possibility too or you could just move with the market direction model uh, signals or you know if you feel uh, differently you could always fade them if, if that's what you want to do but you know you can bob and weave I suppose here and see if you make some progress but uh, we'll, see, we'll really have to see how things shape up once the new year starts so on that note we'll wish everybody a Merry Christmas. I think Hanukkah just finished up, didn't it? Dr. K? Uh, you, know? I, I, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm a terrible Jew. What can I say? <laughs> yeah, I'm actually an honorary Jew. Either. Uh, yeah. My honorary Jewish name is Gil Morolowitz, just so you all know. And I that do works. have a yarmulke that was given to me by some Jewish friends who said I was more Jewish than they are. And I, I hope that was a compliment. But in any it's case... Funny. In my case, it was. It's funny. We've both been declared honorary <laughs> Jews, and then uh, our neighbors who are Jewish to the uh, lineage uh, trace on my dad's last name and name and found out that he's got some Jewish roots. So, okay, uh, so happy, happy, happy end of Hanukkah <laughs> and Merry I Christmas. I did a lot of Passovers, because a, a lot of my Jewish friends will invite me to these Passovers. Always yeah, you know, bot, bot and bar mitzvahs seem to be dominating our social schedule these days with all of my kids' friends turning 13. Anyways, uh, you know, happy holidays, happy Kwanzaa. If there's anybody out there who celebrates Kwanzaa, I'm, I think all holidays are great, and I think we should celebrate as many holidays as possible. Uh, I don't discriminate on the basis of holidays, and uh, since all holidays were made up at some point in time, I see no uh, reason why someone can't just make up more holidays. So we'll have to make up our own holiday, Dr. K. Anyways, yeah, you're, you're that's all we have. <laughs> Twice as many? Or oh, what is and it? I, will, I want to, sh you know, this is great. Uh, someone says here, Merry Christmas, Gil and Dr. K. It's been a great year trading with you guys, my largest year yet. That's good to hear. So, you know, it's that kind of year, though, because I know some people are doing well and some people are having a tough time like we have. You know, we were up 24% last year. In the account Dr. K and I run together, and you know that was a pretty good feat we thought, given the fact that it was a tough year. As and that well. was after fees as well. That's after fees. Yeah, so and uh, well, we can't get into any of that. That's not public information. That's true. The private fund. And, we have to uh, dumb, dumb, dumb it down. But but you know this year we're down a little bit more than that. So it's like you know we should have just taken the last two years off, I guess. But you know I know some people are up. I know some people are getting hit worse, and 
it's a bit of a mixed bag, but it's almost like uh, you had to make had had to have good selections, and and even if you're able to pick up the short side in some cases, that can also help boost your returns. I know it's helped me at times. So, uh, anyways, we'll catch you guys next week. It'll be a short week, but we'll probably be on uh, on air sometime on Thursday, probably as usual. All right, take care, everybody. We'll catch you later. Happy trading. So long, everyone.